My name is Douglas C. or Clayton Fargo. And I was born on October 3rd, 1925 in Lincoln Park, Michigan. I went to uh, a Lincoln Park High School. Um, well, before that, I went to the ele elementary schools. Uh, and then uh, after that, when I came home from World War II, I went to... Yes, sir. Wow. I was, uh, uh, I had been, I had a pilot's license that they wouldn't accept because I, the physical exam was all right except for my eyes, oh. and that wasn't acceptable. So I went into the Army Infantry. When? And, uh, when was that? April the 11th, 1944. And uh, you didn't list, right? Uh, I was a a, a draftee. draftee, draftee. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then? Uh, then I went to uh, um, Fort Hood, Texas, and had uh, infantry basic training, advanced training, jungle training, mm -hmm. and ranger training, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then I was assigned to the uh, 14th Infantry uh, of the 71st Infantry Division at Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, prepared for uh, deployment to Europe. Uh, we were assigned, uh, we went by boat and uh, in January, uh, in La Havre, France, mm -hmm. and uh, we were committed to action in uh, in January of uh, 1945, yeah. and uh, we had uh, two uh, with an infantry unit that I was in, the 14th Infantry, 71st Infantry Division and assigned to General Patton, General Patton's Third Army. We were su successful uh, from that time uh, on all the way through Germany and Austria uh, to successfully defeat the Germans in two major battles, uh, beginning at a town called Vichy, uh, north of Paris. Mm -hmm. And we had two major battles one there and one in Steyr, and uh, then we crossed over and uh, had uh, one, two, three, four, five major engagements in Germany. We were successful in every one of those, and then we went on into Austria and were successful there. From what the, was the level of resistance from the German military, army? Uh, most of it was the Wehrmacht that were uh, commanded by the SS. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I got the feeling that some of them didn't like being in, in the yeah. military. Right. And, uh, but uh, uh, when we got, got to France and in that first battle, I was a PFC. In one week, I was a sergeant. Mm -hmm. How come? They... Uh, uh, one of the sergeants uh, did not, uh, unfortunately, have alcohol to drink, and they put him in the hospital. So I replaced him. And then I became the platoon leader, the platoon sergeant, and we lost the platoon leader, so I was both the platoon sergeant and the platoon leader. Uh, at the uh, uh, end of the war, after two battles in France, five in Germany, and two in Austria, uh, I was uh, designated for a battlefield commission. And uh, so 
I was reassigned after the war to the Dachau concentration camp as the security chief. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. Uh, where, where was it? Dachau. In? Germany. Germany. Yeah, it's about uh, 12, 15 kilometers from Munich. I see. It's a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were holding trials there and in Nuremberg. There were two Nuremberg, trials going. Yes. Nuremberg had trials, so did Dachau. Mm -hmm. um, it, they were trying these people for their atrocities. And uh, I had uh, three interesting prisoners. Uh, Karl Brandt, Hitler's doctor, Field Marshal von Kesslering, mm -hmm. and Admiral Scheidel. The rest were um, guards and, and people who had committed uh, atrocities of one kind or another. And then there was uh, one room full of ladies. Most were nurses. And uh, they were charged with uh, uh, pitchforks, pitchforking American airmen and injecting air into their veins when they came down, you know, very brutal kind of actions. And, and the Germans were very, very uh, detailed in, in their information and report. That's what convicted most of them. But anyway, I, uh, I stayed there until uh, uh, March. Yeah, March of... Uh, 46, and left there in uh, June. Well, I headed home in May and got home in June of 1946. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I went back to my old job and for about uh, five, six months, and then I took advantage of the GI Bill that we had and worked on my industrial engineering degree. Industrial engineering? Mm -hmm. Where? At the Detroit Institute of Technology. Detroit? Institute mm -hmm. of Technology. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was still, then I got married in 1948 and uh, went from day school to night school mm -hmm. because I had, you know, married in had an obligation there, and uh, <clears throat> so I was still working on my degree when I was recalled for Korea. And uh, I got the letter in December of 1950, and I went back on duty in January of 1951. You didn't need any basic training. Well, I. You're out of veterans. <laughs> well, what happened is, is I had accepted my commission mm -hmm. as a uh, army infantry officer, and uh, so, and I was reassigned to what they call a ready reserve. Mm -hmm. So when I went back on duty, I went back on duty as a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, Infant, Army infantry, and uh, then I took uh, two or three courses that the Army had uh, insisted that I have before I deployed overseas. Mm -hmm. What kind? Uh, I had uh, tactics, uh, command and control deployed into. Uh, to the Far East, and I tried to stop in Japan, and I had uh, a three-week course in uh, chemical, biological, radiological war before I was uh, reassigned to uh, to Korea. Uh, I reported to Colonel Hightower, who later, he passed on here a few years ago. He was he became a major general, and we were good friends.
because we joined the same uh, veterans organization together. And so he assigned me to uh, <clears throat> what they call L Company, Love Company, as you can see on there, for the 32nd Infantry on Heartbreak Ridge. When did you arrive in Korea? Uh, I arrived in Korea in uh, November. Oh. November of 1951, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay. And... Where did you arrive? I, I arrived in Busan, and then they took us by train to... Uh, uh, Chinchon, I think it was. Chinchon? I think so, where the... Yeah, that's the east side. Yeah, on the east side. Uh, and uh, reported to Colonel Hightower for assignment. Mm -hmm. And I had two primary MOSs, one as a supply officer, the other as an infantry uh, operations officer. He said, I need need both, but I need one more than I do the other. <laughs> so he assigned me to uh, L Company on Heartbreak Ridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was the command of a platoon that was on uh, Heartbreak Ridge. And uh, during the time we were there from uh, November to March, mm -hmm. uh, I conducted... Uh, 11 combat missions mm. and uh, defended Heartbreak Ridge twice from uh, the North Koreans and uh, the Chinese at that time. And uh, so, and I lost three men to wounds. Uh, You'll see by the uh, the list, I have a, a, a roster of my men mm. that included two South Korean soldiers. Oh. And, uh, and you're welcome to that. Yeah. Uh, this uh, is uh, November 51 and February 52. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice that both in... Uh, Fourth Squad, yeah, and, and both the Fourth Squad were two very, very fine Korean uh, infantrymen. You'll see that in the Fourth fourth Squad there, their names. I tried, when I was in Korea in 2010, I tried to locate them through the uh, military Veterans Association, and uh, I had no success. Uh, You're welcome to that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's very good. Okay. And nice of you that you keep this uh, roster of your platoon, and there are two Koreans, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you remember anything about them? Uh, when I went on patrol, uh -huh. they did your job. They did a fine job. They Did followed they orders. I didn't send them on patrol. Uh -huh. They went with me. Uh -huh. I never went to send anybody out on patrol without without me in wow. any way uh, because, you know, uh, I had the advanced training uh -huh. uh, in World War II, and so my tactics were a little bit different in World War II. Mm -hmm. World War II in... France, Germany, and Austria, you didn't run into any mountains of any kind right, right. like you do in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and I had three Native Americans at the same time mm -hmm. that were excellent scouts. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were uh, two Navajo and one uh, Lakota Sioux. But the two Koreans came in handy when we captured any North Koreans of one kind or another. Then I had interpreters. And uh, so we you worked. captured North Korean soldiers? 
Oh, yes, sir. Well, yeah. Uh, three, I think, three times. Can you remember one of those days that how you captured them and how what can you describe the scene? Well, on on two occasions they uh, they attacked my position, mm-hmm. and when that, they came through there and they all they had was one of the potato mashers, what they call a potato masher, that's a, a hand. Grenade, grenade. Yeah. and uh, so all all I had to do was uh, when they come through is one of my guys would hit him on the back of the head and knock him out, and, and then we'd uh, find out what units they were in and so on and so forth mm-hmm. with my uh, two Korean soldiers, and uh, and then took just and then took uh, them down the hill. And they gave them to the MPs. Yeah. So uh, uh, that was twice that they attacked. And then once on patrol, I, I uh, was able to uh, uh, corner and surround a group. Uh-huh. And uh, they were about 1,500 yards in their camp. And But I had to be careful when I maneuvered down through the valleys because the mountain fingers that come down, they hide in there. And so I have to have a sharp ride scout in front of me. To, mm-hmm. That's the only person that was in front of me. All the rest of my men were on either one side or the other. And and one I kept, one squad I kept in reserve uh, to uh, back up uh, in case I needed uh, to uh, make a charge of one kind or another. But, uh, yeah, I did 11 of those. Good. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we we were pretty successful. Uh, yeah. And I was glad to be able to do that. And I think because of the experience from World War II, World II yeah, yeah it, uh, it, it paid off. I only put one scout in front of me. In World War II, I used two uh, to cover two flanks because of open areas. Mm-hmm. In Korea, it's not so open in those valleys. <laughs> so it's more dangerous. Yeah. So you stayed there in Chuncheon all the time, or did you move to any other location? No, uh, I was uh, only, and when I when I left, I was uh, I'd left from Heartbreak Ridge. Mm-hmm. It, when did you leave for the state? State back. Uh, in. Uh, March uh, of uh, 1952, but I had to, because of my status, I was allowed to rotate, Mm -hmm. and uh, so I went, uh, they put us on a a train to Tegu, and then from Tegu we went to uh, Busan, and then crossed over from there. So uh, I uh, I look at Korea today and compare it to it <laughs> what was then. A lot of difference. Uh, I in 2010 I was invited to come back to Korea uh, for the celebration, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, because I was a unit commander during that period of time. And I tried to locate those those yeah. two Korean soldiers, and I, I couldn't uh, couldn't find where they may have been. You know, I'm only dealing with uh, probably a good-sized family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what was the difference when you go back in 2010? Were you able to recognize anything? They wouldn't let us go up on the DMZ. Mm -hmm. Uh, The difference was buildings that were higher than 10 stories (laughs) in Seoul and... and, uh, 10 stories in the lower building. Yeah. And uh, so I was surprised that Seoul was so modernistic. And the airport at Incheon is... Best in the world. Oh, yeah. 
it uh, uh, a really modern country, uh, very hospitable. Uh, I, I have found that uh, uh, each time, because I've gone back there uh, when I was working, uh, I worked as an industrial engineer for 10 years in the automotive industry for three different companies. I did that for 10 years, then I went to work for the United States government. And uh, I did investigations and evaluations for the next 30 years. It include about two-thirds of the country, of the world, in countries. I've been on every continent except Antarctica. And uh, so I've had assignments in Korea, and I noticed this last time that the really modernistic growth that's going on, you know. Yeah, it's the uh, eighth largest trading country in the world. Yeah. Yeah, 13, 12 largest economy in the world. Yeah. With the size of Indiana. Yes, yeah. It's very impressive, but we couldn't do it without your sacrifice. Well, uh, I tell you what, I had Koreans with me too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, uh, I was really, really impressed with the modernization that has taken place in Korea. Um, it's, um, it's a shame that everybody has to be on alert because of those in the north. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, one of these days that will be a unified country. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What was the happiest moment during your service in Korea? Um, when I got recalled <laughs> off of the combat area, uh, but um, I was happy that my casualties were down. The, when you're an infantry unit commander, you know, uh, statistics tell you that you're going to lose maybe 80, 85 percent of your people. Um, and I felt as though uh, I was very fortunate to hold my casualties down to just three. And, That's very impressive. Yeah. Uh, you did well, take care of them. Well, uh, a lot of the commanders uh, send out their sergeants and so on. I don't believe in that. Uh, if I'm going to command a group, I'm going to be right there and, and let them follow me. Yeah, that's and I think that's important. You brought many uh, documents there. Would you show that to the camera? Oh, sure. This. Is that visible? Hold it up. This is a historical map Mm -hmm. and history Mm -hmm. of the Korean War. Major battles. Major battles. That's great. Who who produced that? Uh, One of the um, friends of mine Mm -hmm. uh, showed me this, and it came out of a publisher's house in California, if I remember right. Okay. uh, But uh, you're welcome to this copy. And, uh, but it, it shows uh, significant events on one side, and then there's other uh, facts and so on and so forth on this other side. But, uh, and the, uh, the other map that I'm going to uh, give to you is of the battles with the American, American identified areas. <laughs> They called, yeah. you know, all those different ones. And uh, so you're welcome to that one. You. And you see on the eastern side is a Heartbreak Ridge and the Iron Triangle mm-hmm. that um, my um, unit, the 32nd Infantry, was part of. And um, uh, it's my pleasure for you to have these. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then, in addition to that, I have for you... Uh-huh. Uh, the orders for uh, uh, a bronze star. Uh-huh. 
Okay. So you got the bronze stuff? It, I have two of them. Two of them? Yes, sir. From one from Korean War? One from World War II, one yeah. from Korea. The award is uh, uh, written First Lieutenant Douglas C. Fargo, mm -hmm. uh, 0986127 yeah. Infantry, United States Army a member of L Company, 32nd, distinguished himself by meritorious service during the period of November to February. During this period, Lieutenant Fargo performed his duties as platoon leader in an <coughs> exemplary manner. Through his aggressiveness and outstanding leadership, uh, I developed a platoon which was an effective fighting unit. Any other comments about your service and the uh, lessons of the war to Americans and young generations here? We need to uh, maintain our freedoms. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, ha we, we are tested by people, especially those that get into politics uh, in more ways than one. I, uh, I I didn't bring a copy of it, but I'll, I'll put one in the pack for you where they want to take away the privilege of uh, religion. Uh, I just got that from a friend of mine. And uh, that's ridiculous. We, you and I both have constitutions that says we have freedom of religion, yeah. and uh, and they they want to eliminate that from the military. Mm. And uh, I I don't I don't agree with that. That's violation of our constitutions, and, and uh, to me that's a real irritation. What is your religion? Uh, I am a Methodist. United Methodist, uh, and uh, I was going to the Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, when you get some negatives of one kind or another, uh, you know, rather than create a, a stir of one kind or another, you move. And I have belonged to the Methodist Church ever since I've been 18 years old. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, during World War II, I was given a pocket-sized copy of the New Testament. And I, I didn't mention that to you, but I had that in my pocket in World War II. Ironically, in those uh, artillery barrages, that we experienced, I got hit and knocked down twice. Both of those projectiles hit my left chest where that New Testament was oh boy. and didn't penetrate. Oh boy. So, guess who was looking over me? <laughs> you know, that's the way I feel about it. Do you have the Bible? Yes, it's a copy of the New, New Testament. It's about yay thick that I had in my pocket. My son is a retired Army artillery officer. Mm. So, and I have two grandchildren. And in July of this year, I'll have a great-grandchild. <laughs> and uh, I'm told it's going to be a boy, so that'll carry the name on. <laughs> And uh, uh, I uh, probably will uh, concentrate on making sure that my grandchildren uh, take care of uh, my memorabilia and that kind of information. Yep. And uh, I uh, uh, recently transferred my uh, membership to uh, the uh, Korean War Veterans Unit, mm -hmm. uh, 313, yeah. and I was in Frederick, but Frederick was too far for me to drive back and forth, so I switched yeah. 
And uh, I find these guys are really worthwhile. And uh, we enjoyed the other night, Tuesday, yeah. in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah. So, but, um, yeah, my, uh, I also unfortunately lost a grandson oh. in Baghdad. In two, oh, Baghdad. In Baghdad in 2006. He was a combat medic, and uh, he uh, had uh, a couple of experiences by help, helping to save some lives because of a road bomb of one kind or another. And uh, in uh, the, on the 22nd of July, uh, 2006, my son calls me and uh, said that uh, his son Adam had been killed by a roadside bomb uh, after they came back after a uh, night patrol because he was working with the engineers. But he loved the Army. And he and I had a real good, close relationship. Mm, and so yeah, 22 years old and... Uh, but they had put that uh, IED on the side of a small bridge that went back into their base, and they were coming off of patrol at about 6 o'clock or so in the morning, so I'm told. And uh, he was driving the Humvee, and he got the full blast, so his body wasn't viewable. But uh, he was doing what he wanted to do. And uh, he loved the Army. And uh, when the Army gives you the combat medical badge and a Bronze Star, you know, he's he's done his job. So the other grand, grandson is uh, uh, in the soccer program in the state of Virginia. And uh, he and his wife or due to have a baby, the, the baby I told you about in July. So, And uh, my granddaughter uh, is not interested in <laughs> getting married. So not right now anyway. So, But she's a fine lady. She has a master's degree in uh, uh, psychology. And uh, she works for an organization where they help people. So... That's You're great. Proud of your family. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Douglas, I want to thank you for your service and uh, especially your special care of your platoon members. I never seen anybody who still uh, keeping the roster of your whole members and especially those two Korean names. It was so glad to see that. And uh, as a one of Korean nation, on behalf of Korean nation, I want to thank you for your service. There is no Korea without your fight for us, and I hope that you continue to support Korea. We sure will. Mm. We I want sure. to present the certificate of ambassador for peace, which is uh, issued by the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, the Minister Park Sun Chun, and the Korean Veterans Association, Park Se Hwan. Okay. And I wrote your name in Korean. Oh, okay. Stop ta go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I did receive the peace medal uh -huh. from your president wow. in, that was president in 2010. Yeah. I'm very proud of that. And, I'm, and I wear that quite often uh, when we have a get-together. And, and I wear my awards and decorations that... Uh, Go with that.